And so we're in a series on Sunday night entitled Jesus Christ, the Servant of Humanity. Tonight we'll be in Mark chapter 14, verses 1 through 11. And um, the proposition, what we want to put on your heart tonight, want you to walk home and to meditate upon this throughout this next week is, uh, do what you can for Jesus. Do what you can for Jesus. And we'll see that phrase um, in our text tonight. Jesus uh, makes that kind of a comment. Now the little uh, red line down on there at the bottom is uh, reconciling people to God through Christ. And so that's just a tagline. Uh, it's not part of the actual outline. Now, um, Mark chapter 14, verse 8, as I uh, was pointing out, is where we get this in our text. She hath done what she could. She has come uh, forehand to um, anoint my body to the burying. And so she has done what she could. So we want to do what we can tonight for Jesus. And so we just have a few points on this. Let's look here. Uh, our first point tonight, the Passover plot. Now, uh, Mark chapter 14, verses 1 through 11 is like many of the other sections in the Gospel of Mark where it's a sandwich section. There's a couple of verses that uh, preface our text that we'll really focus on tonight, and then there's a couple of verses that end uh, after the, the text that we're going to focus on tonight. But uh, let's look at verses 1 and 2, and let's get the first piece of bread in the sandwich. After two days... Uh, was the feast of the Passover of unleavened bread. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might um, take him by craft and put him to death. But they said, not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar of the people. Now, if you would, please join me and go down to verses 9 and 10. Actually, 10 and 11. And Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went unto the chief priest to betray him uh, unto them. And when they heard of it, they were glad, and promised to give him money. And he sought how he might conveniently betray him. And so, this is the second piece of bread. Um, now, what is in the meat? What's the meat between these two things? So, let's look at verses 3 through 9 for just a moment. And being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at meat, there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment of spikenard, very precious. And that she brake the box and poured it on his head. And there were some that had indignation within themselves and said, Why was this waste of the ointment made? For it might have been sold for more than 300 pence and have been given to the poor. And they murmured against her. Jesus said, Let her alone, why trouble ye her? She hath wrought a good work on me. For you have the poor with you always, and whenever you will, you may do to them good. But to me you have not always. She hath done what she could, and has come aforehand to anoint my body to the burying. Verily I say unto you, wherever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she hath done shall be spoken of a memorial for her. So let's look tonight then at um, doing what we can for Jesus. Point number one, the Passover plot. Uh, verse one, the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him by craft and put him to death. And so they're plotting, they're scheming. Um, they want to do this uh, during the Passover season. Now in verses one and two, you have two different uh, parts of the Passover season that take place. Besides the Passover, Passover proper, uh, you have the, uh, the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. And so uh, Passover is actually a week-long uh, holiday. So it's more than just one night. It lasts a whole week. This usually takes place in our calendars in the month of March and April. Now I call that Marple, and that's one of my favorite months of the year. Uh, my second favorite month of the year is October, and so those are my two favorite months. But um, here in March, April, it's uh, in the Jewish calendar, the 15th of Nisan or Abib, and um, it's the celebration when the death angel passed over the land of Egypt. And when he saw the blood upon a house, he passed over that, and the firstborn lived. 
But if there was no blood over that household door, then the death angel visited that home, and he struck down, he killed the firstborn. And so that very night then, uh, the Israelites were uh, freed from their bondage as slaves in Egypt after 430 years. Now this is, Passover is typically celebrated at the first full moon after the uh, vernal equinox or the spring equinox. The, uh, the Jewish people then would take a lamb and they would sacrifice it in the afternoon, prepare it, and then eat it that evening. And um, so Jewish days, we need to understand, begin at sundown, not at midnight. And so evening and morning were the first day. Evening and morning were the second day and so forth throughout uh, the creation week. Now, so we have the Passover proper that will be uh, taking place during this week. But you also have the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, the Feast of Unleavened Bread was a week-long feast. And to prepare their homes, they would go through uh, the kitchen and any place where food was taken in a home, and they would clean it thoroughly, looking for any yeast that might contaminate the unleavened bread and, and cause it to, to rise and to swell. And so they would purify, they would purge the home. And um, this was a week-long festival. Now, these uh, festivals uh, overlap one another, and they are what you would call one of the three pilgrim feasts in Israel where the, the Jewish men were commanded three times a year to come to the city of Jerusalem. So there are tens of thousands of families and strangers in the city. The crowds are swelling, and we'll see how this is important to the scribes and the religious leaders in just a moment. But um, here is uh, an application um, in this. Leaven in the Old Testament was a symbol of sin. And so they were supposed to not only have cleansed homes, but they were supposed to have cleansed hearts and to remove any impediment before themselves and God. And so in our text tonight, Did the religious leaders have a clean heart? Or was it defiled with murder, with the thoughts of murder? And so only homes, um, not only the homes should be cleaned, but hearts also. So anyone who has a heart full of hatred towards Jesus has a defiled heart and needs to have their heart cleansed. So this is the Passover, the meaning of the Passover, the application of the Passover. And so we now look at the second point, the plot. And so it tells us here that in verses 1 and 2 that the scribes sought how they might take him by craft. The use of the imperfect tense, how they sought, is a repeated action. In other words, this is premeditated murder. This is premeditated murder. This is what they're setting up. And so this is over a period of time, and therefore the determination of the leaders is to destroy Jesus. Now, do you realize there are people who hate Jesus even today? This is from a social media post that just a random woman put up online. Now, what I've done in her, um, her post is I had to correct some of the punctuation and the capitalization and spelling, but the words are her own, and I won't name her, um, but this is what she put down. I hate Jesus because he's a liar, and the Bible is just an old book full of myths. If he were alive now, I would love to see the Romans burn him on an upside-down cross. He has deceived the whole world with his lies and false promises in order to promote his evil alien agenda, the Elohim who want to steal the credit of creation of man from the true gods, the Anunnaki, the Babylonian Sumerian gods. We must purge our sacred planet from this cancer called Christianity. Boy, doesn't that sound peaceful and tolerant? Then and only then can we truly have a chance to bring true peace 
to the world. I hate Jesus. That's what she says. But there are many people in our culture and our society, maybe they wouldn't go that way out on a limb to say the Anuki were the original creator's God, but they could at least identify with that statement, I hate Jesus. And so there are still people who have defiled hearts, and they have murder in their hearts. And if Jesus was here, they would murder him again. And so this is um, not only the Passover, but this is the plot. Now, the problem was the fear of man uh, and the, the large crowds. All right, so let's look here. Verse 2, but they said, not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar of the people. Now, Mark makes a distinction between the people who were often very favorable to Jesus and the leaders who were usually hostile. Let's be very clear. We're not trying to be anti-Semitic by pointing out a text like this. And the New Testament is trying, not trying to be anti-Jewish in any way. It's just stating a fact. The leaders hated Jesus, and they hated him so much that they were going to murder him. Now, the people are not that way. So let's not go around and try to remove Jews from the earth. Let's not try to uh, do a Russian program and, and move them from parts of the world. Let's not have a, a purge like Hitler did in, in Germany. Let's not go and, and hate the Jews. That's not what this is about. Uh, the blessing of Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, still is in force. I will bless them that bless you, and I will curse those that curse you. And so those that have cursed Israel um, have received a curse themselves. So here's what is taking place. We will see... Uh, in verses 9 and 10, I'm sorry, 10 and 11, that the plans were changed. But how were they changed? Well, perhaps on a human level you could say because Judas made an offer to betray Jesus. But another here is that Mark wanted to show that the timing of Jesus' enemies was overturned by God himself and that there's a sovereign God who is in control of the circumstances of our life. Well, there are a couple of other ways that you might be able to look at this, but the concern of the officials was about a riot. And it was understandable because during this festival, uh, the pilgrim feasts, the inhabitants sometimes of, of Jerusalem doubled, tripled, or quadrupled or more. And emotions ran very high during these high holy days. And so we see the, uh, the Passover plot. We see... Uh, the Passover, we see the plot, and we see the problem. Now, our second point here tonight is the uh, priceless perfume, verses 3 through 9, uh, specifically verse 8, an alabaster box of ointment of spikenard, very precious. Now, this was an import uh, into the land of Israel, and it was very costly. And um, it was made into a beautiful perfume that would anoint somebody. Now, you'll see here in our text later on uh, about the cost, the comment that is made on the cost, 300 pence. That's a year's salary. There's going to be a dramatic difference between Mary doing what she could do and her cost of worshiping Jesus, and then what she actually gets out of Jesus. All right, so a year's worth of salary, whatever you make in a year, imagine buying an item that costs that much, just that one item, and then you were to give that to the Lord as a gift. That would be an extravagant, that would be an extraordinary measure. It would be a lavish gift. Now, the reason why we have narrative where it is between the, the act of the, the religious leaders and the act of Judas is to point out the passion of Jesus. This is the Passion Week. And there's some spiritual insight that we need to gain from this act of affection that Mary puts upon Jesus. But this is not the same thing that happens about a week before. This is just a couple of days before uh, his crucifixion. And so let's look here, beginning in verse 3, at the adoration of Jesus. 
we see that he is in the home in Bethany, the home of Simon the leper. Now, we don't know much about this man, but we do know that he had the epitaph, Simon the leper. He had been somebody that the Lord had healed of leprosy, which was a curse upon your life because it, it set you apart from society. It ostracized you. You were a leper colony. You were off with the other lepers, and you were uh, in a death sentence. And so now this man has been restored to fellowship with his friends and his family, and he's having Jesus in his home. What an honor to have Jesus in your home. But what a beautiful thing. And this is the homage that is being paid to him uh, to entertain Jesus as he's on the road traveling because Jesus is from Nazareth. He's on the road. He's traveling. And so this man is opening his home in an act of hospitality. Hospitality is the forgotten Christian virtue where we need to open our homes. Now, I know that's hard during COVID, so I'm not, I'm not saying throw caution to the wind, but hospitality. And this is what Simon the leper is doing, and it's honoring to him. But here comes the, the act of um, adoration here, is that as he sat at meat, as he was at dinner, there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment of spikenard, very precious, and she break the box and poured it upon his head. And so this was a hand-carved piece of alabaster, which is um, rock material that is translucent and very costly just to make the container that's holding it and to make it thin enough so it had a long neck on it that would um, be very dainty, all right, very fragile. And so even the container is, is costly. And what is inside is extremely valuable. The spikenard comes from um, India. Now, do you remember later on in the gospel stories when Jesus is being crucified, how the soldiers will gamble for his vesture, for his garments? Do you know why they're doing that? Because of this act. They are willing to even rip that garment and have a fourth of it because it is so valuable. That is a quarter's year th uh, uh, worth of a year's wage. First, second, third, or fourth quarter, it doesn't matter. It, it, it's a very valuable thing. And so that spikenard is still in his clothes. And it's just a beautiful, beautiful smell that is here. And it's very, very costly. So it was precious, and it was an anointing. You know something else that was very precious that will be shed and, and spilled in just a few days? The blood of Jesus Christ. For you are not redeemed with corruptible things, such as silver and gold, received by vain tradition from your fathers, but you are redeemed with the precious blood of a lamb without blemish and without spot. The blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. What a beautiful thing. And so um, we know from a parallel account in Matthew's gospel that this was Mary who was doing this. So it was very precious and it was also a very personal act. Think of the courage that it took for her to come in to a social setting like this and to enter a room full of men as they were eating and walk up to Jesus and to anoint him. And so she does this, and it's a very costly act, very extravagant, and, and one which we'll need to learn tonight to emulate in our lives. But now notice with me the reaction to the people in the room, all right? Verse 4, uh, so she pours it on his head, verse 3, and there were some that had indignation within themselves. Indignation is an exclamation. What? What? Uh, I can't believe this. When the, the, when the flask is broken and the smell begins to permeate the room and everybody recognizes the smell of spikenard, most expensive, lavish perfume or ointment that they know at the time, a whole year's worth in one bottle, what in the world? 
What does this woman think she's doing? Is she crazy? Has she lost it? And so then there is an evaluation. All right? So why was this waste of the anointment made? Um, ointment. This is a waste. This is a waste. And there were some that had indignation with themselves and said, why was this waste of the ointment made? Verse 5, for it might have been sold for more than 300 pence and had been given to the poor. And so their evaluation, a year's salary. You know, here's the wonderful thing about her gift. It's extravagant. I say even excessive. But it is her act of devotion to Jesus. It was precious. It was very personal. And, you know, Christians, we're not bound just by our duty to tithe. Christians are set free to give as the Lord has prospered us. We can give above and beyond the tithe, and we should give above and beyond our tithe. We should give like Mary. We should give extravagantly. It's not the, the, the amount of the gift that we see. The extravagance is measured in, in the widow's might. Other people came in that day, and they gave because they had the ability to give, and it wasn't really a sacrifice. But the widow, she threw in her two pennies. She threw in her might. And that's all she could give. And it left her in a place of destitution. And so these two women, the widow who gave her might, and Mary with her costly gift of the spikenard ointment, teach us it's not the actual amount that is given, but really the motive uh, that is given is an act of worship, dedication of trust to the Lord. And we as Christians can give way beyond a tithe. We can tithe. Anybody can tithe. But will we give in such an extravagant way? And so that was the evaluation. The explanation was, well, it could be given to the poor. And we'll look at that in just a moment. Um, but that's what they thought that it should have been used for. Well, if she was going to do that, I mean, come on, we could have uh, put it on the table and right there and then we could have had a, an auction and we could have had a, something go to the highest bidder, and then we could have taken the proceeds from that auction, and, and we could have given it to the poor. I mean, just think of the community food bank and how much money they could receive. And so they were saying there was a better use for this. And so then their emotions are involved in this as well. And so they murmured against her. They're grumbling. What has she done? She's crazy. She's nuts. What a waste. What a bad steward. What a lousy follower of Jesus. What a horrible disciple. She's not thinking. And they started complaining and murmuring against her. And so we see then what this does uh, when Jesus recognizes what's going on. We see the appreciation of Jesus in 6 through 8. And Jesus said, Let her alone, why trouble ye her? She hath wrought a good work on me. For you have the poor with you always, and whenever, uh, whensoever ye will, you may do them good. But, ye, but me ye have not always. She hath done what she could, and she has come aforehand to anoint my body to the burying. So the Lord defended her. You know, I was taking an extended uh, education unit this week, and we were uh, talking about um, finance. And uh, part of it d d jumped out to me. It really has nothing to do with finance, all right? But uh, one of the workshop speakers said, integrity is acting on an injustice when you know it's there and rectifying it, not remaining silent. You know, that's part of the problem in our society today, isn't it? Too many people, when there's injustices, they remain silent, and we need to speak up. We as the church need to speak up. Uh, we have a, a valid point from the authority of the Scriptures to speak to certain things. And we need to speak to them. And so the Lord defends her, and then the Lord actually deflated them. The Lord says, you know what? Actually, your evaluation of the situation is completely wrong. I am actually worth what she poured on me, what she anointed me with. She has not wasted anything. She has dedicated it to my glory. She has come before. 
And, and so the Lord is uh, deflating them. You see, they have some, some social blindness here. First of all, they're blind to this poor woman and what they did to her. Think of the courage that it took for her to come in and do that. And then to see, quote, spiritual men criticize her publicly, shame and put her down and gossip right in front of her, murmur against her. I think Jesus must have looked up at Mary and seen the wince or the pained expression on her face. And his heart just jumped out to defend her. You don't know what you're talking about. What she's done is a very beautiful thing. And so he comes in, and so they have a blindness to this, but they also have a blindness about the poor. Jesus says, you have the poor with you always. Um, And whatever you want, you can do them good. But me, I'm not always going to be here. And so, yes, what she's done, she's done in a worthy manner. I am worth what she has done. You know, the poor, as the church, should always be a concern of the church. To true religion or pure religion and undefiled before God is to visit the widow and the orphan and to keep oneself unspotted from the world, but to care for the orphan and the widow. So ministering to the poor is a work of the church. Uh, We're to minister to the sick and the suffering, the handicapped, the impaired, the insane, um, the dropouts of society. And if you stop and you think about it, the Christian church has risen to the occasion and brought glory to God throughout the century by starting hospitals and schools and orphanages and uh, shelter places. Um, And so this is a a cold, cruel world. And the disciples were that cold, cruel group that night. And Jesus corrects them. And so far from her being an outcast, in their opinion, Jesus embraces what she's done. According to Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 11, notice what the Lord says about the poor. For the poor shall never cease out of the land. Therefore I command thee, saying, Thou shalt open thy hand wide unto thy brother, to thy poor, and to thy needy in thy land. Think of the ancestors of Jesus. Ruth was poor and needy. And Boaz was generous and opened his hand and said, yes, come glean in my field. It's there. Without that, we wouldn't have a a Messiah. Wouldn't have a Savior. And so, have we as the conservative church forgotten the poor? We should stop allowing the state to receive God's glory. The state, many times, does a wonderful job in meeting the needs of poor people. I mean, I'll be honest, they do. But we ought to rise to that occasion as the church. And so the liberal church meets many temporal needs, but they fail to preach the gospel and souls perish and go into hell. But is it that the conservative church fails to meet a temporal need, and as a result, do souls go to hell early before they get a chance to hear the gospel? Good question for us to, compl- to con- contemplate. Okay? So the object is to meet both temporal and eternal needs. And so they were lacking in evaluation of even their ministry to the poor. Now let's go back to the woman here. The criticism by the disciples struck a very sour note. Jesus must have picked up on the look on her face and um, it must have required her act of dedication, considerable thought, resolution, and courage. And so, in any case, he heard these harsh and thoughtless words and sprang immediately into action. And so, notice how he praises her in verse 8. She hath done what she could. She has come aforehand to anoint my body to the burying. Um, then uh, he says, she has done a good work. Okay? So by focusing on 
his coming death, Jesus commended the appropriateness of her actions. He tacitly admitted that he was worth sacrifice. Now, he wasn't disparaging giving to the poor or helping them, but he's saying here is a true emphasis that needs to be made. The value of his presence. The value of his presence. And so he would soon be taken away. And she has insight. They have blindness. They're dull. You see, this act of worship soared far above the comprehension of the disciples, who for weeks now have been ignoring the clear, plain teaching of Jesus. I'm going to die. I'm going to be buried. I'm going to rise again. I'm going to suffer many things at the hands of the religious leaders. No, Jesus, that's not going to happen to you. Get thee behind me, Satan, he said to Peter. And when Jesus tells this to them, they push it to the farthest recess of their mind. They don't want to think about it. But when this woman heard this, she had spiritual insight. She understood what the Lord was saying. He's going to die. She saw what was taking place in the, in the plan of God's redemption. These men did not. Peter could have done this, but he didn't see it. John might have been able to do something like this. Thomas might have been able to do that. Any of them might have been able to do what she did, but none of them did. She did. And Jesus was not going to let her be criticized for her extravagant gift. And so then we see what Jesus says, that the generations to come, you right now, tonight, in this room, wherever you are online, you can admire this woman for what she's done. So notice with me in verse 9. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she hath done shall be spoken of her for a memorial of her. Wow. That action was rewarded by being inspired in eternal Scripture. Now, you and I today, we may not get that honor, right? Because the Bible is a closed book. It's, it's, it's written. It's completed. But you know, God does have other books that He's writing in. And He remembers what we've done. For God is not unjust to forget your work and your labor of love which you have shown toward the saints and that you have ministered and do minister to them. God remembers what we do. And so no one can do a service to the Lord, one that touches his heart so dearly, and not have it one day advertised. Hey, where'd you get that crown? Well, let me tell you. So it will be told for, uh, of her to all generations. It will be heralded across the everlasting corridors of time. It's remembered for all of eternity what she did that night. Oh, what a beautiful thing. Jesus doesn't forget us. And so that motivates us. It's an incentive for us to give lavishly, to give extraordinarily, to give extravagantly, to give sacrificially. We can do what we should do for Jesus. We should give. It's not the amount, as the widow shows, but the heart. It's giving to the point of sacrifice. It's giving to the point of adoration and of worship. And so this gospel story is now published in thousands of languages throughout the world. Men and women and boys and girls learn of her forever. What a wonderful thing. It's been preached now for more than 2,000 years, and country after country, and century after century. Do what you can for Jesus. All right, tonight then, in closing, let's look at um, our last point here, the uh, purchase price, uh, verses 10 and 11. It says here, and they promised to give him money. Um, it says here, Something very shocking. And Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to betray him unto them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. 
and he sought how he might conveniently betray him. The religious leaders were delighted at this unexpected solution to their problem, to their dilemma. How to lay hands on Christ at such um, a well-populated feast. Okay, how do you do it? And when there would be no crowds that would get in the way. So what sheer good fortune to their movements and intentions. They were glad, Mark says, imagine that. They rejoiced. What terrible glee. What twisted souls. There was a hearty handshake and all around once that terrible bargain had been struck and Judas was gone. And so we see Judas the traitor. Now no doubt the rabbis looked upon the treachery of Judas as an act of providence which justified their plot against Jesus. Now this word betray found here in verse 10 to betray him unto them means to hand over to sell him down the river. They were glad. Actually, this word glad is um, Cairo. Uh, the, it is a very expressive word of a feeling of inward joy. They were overjoyed. Oh, how exciting! And, and they just didn't want to betray how excited they were. Sickness fills their heart. Now the terms, the promise of money, and they promise to give him money. Now this is a very interesting account from the Gospel of Matthew chapter 26, verse 15. Um, there's a trade going on for Jesus. Okay? Judas is bartering for Jesus. What will you give me, Matthew 26, 15? What are you willing, rather, to give me? It brings out the, the, the chaffering aspect of the transaction, so cold and calloused. And so they covenanted with him, they promised. Uh, they weighed unto him, very literally, they placed for him in the balances, the shekeled coins of silver that were heavier in weight than the common silver coins. And so this was used in the temple when um, considerable sums were paid out of the temple treasury. But this was not really a considerable sum. Do you realize that if this were today's evaluation, if you value the shekel at 72 cents, the sum would be $21.60. That's what Judas sold Jesus for. You notice the difference of what Judas thought Jesus was worth and what Mary thought Jesus was worth? Do you see that in our text? And so those 30 pieces of silver is a reference to Zechariah chapter 11 and verse 12. The, this was the price of a slave. 20 bucks. You see, Jesus would die to purchase us off the slave market of sin. But it was an extravagant, extravagant gift, the gift of his life, the gift of his blood. A precious lamb without blemish and without spot. How much is the blood of Jesus Christ worth? It's priceless. There's no evaluation and Jesus loved us. And so here's just simple terms. Okay? Mark just almost glosses over it. Just a promise of money. Why Matthew mentions this 30 pieces of silver, the price of a slave. And then we see the treacher, uh, treachery here in closing. Judas is looking conveniently. Now this is a key word. Um, this is the whole point of the offer of Judas. He claimed that he knew enough of the activities and the schedule of Jesus, his habits, that would enable the chief priest to catch him in the absence of a multitude without waiting for the Passover to be over when the crowds would have left. 
So his position in the inner circle of disciples gave him an advantage which the chief priests did not have without him. And so what treachery. But why was this mentioned before and after Mary's extravagant gift? For a contrast that's as wide <laughs> or wider than the Gulf of the Grand Canyon to show us the, the love that Mary had and the hatred that the religious leaders had and, and the callousness that Judas had in his heart towards Jesus. We don't have time to go into his motives, but essentially Judas thought that he had lost out. But he truly did lose out when he sold his soul for just $21. Tonight, do what you can for Jesus. Give extravagantly to the Lord. It's not the amount, but it's the motive in what we give to the Lord. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for giving to us uh, your Son and the fact that his blood is precious. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your shed blood that forgives us of our sins. Lord, thank you for this memorial uh, that you have given about Mary, that wherever the gospel is preached, people will hear uh, this story. It's part of that Passion Week. Lord, it's part of the gospel that God is an extravagant giver. And uh, Mary just got to be an imitator of that. But Lord, thank you for her example. Lord, help us to realize that we're not bound to give according to duty. But Lord, we're set free to give with extravagance and great love and to do what we can do for you in our lifetime. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you for being with us tonight. We trust that uh, you'll be encouraged through the Word of God. Please comment, like, and share on social media. And good evening. We'll see you next week.